Hey guys, v here with another V-Plays, and recently on my last video post, somebody asked me, how do I make credits in this game? And my obvious answer is going to be a premium aircraft. Now, I'm not advocating spending money in the game in order to get an aircraft. For those of you that are longtime viewers of my channel, you'll know this is the plane that I recommend. You go ahead and get the Vampire F1 through a series of missions that are available to all new players, and you get this thing, you have a tier A premium, it's going to give you better payout, you can train all of your British crews in it, and the thing does very well for itself. It has good guns, good maneuverability, good airspeed, decent altitude performance, and is kind of a jack of all trades depending on how you decide to set it up. So you can have it match your play style. But for a lot of the newer folks out there that are probably really hurting for credits, maybe you aren't quite there yet. The Vampire has much higher requirements in order to unlock this aircraft, but at the same time, you can swap between trying to unlock the Vampire or also getting the XP-55 Ascender at Tier 6. This thing is a lot easier to unlock, and honestly, it's probably one of the most user-friendly aircraft of the two. The reason I say that is because it is extremely maneuverable right out of the box, and once you get the thing specialized, which you will because it's a premium and you're going to fly the wings off of it for those credits, you are going to be a force to be reckoned with. I have a video out there calling this thing the Spit Killer because it chews up Spitfires. Even if somebody set up with a full maneuverability build, this thing is going to give it a serious run for its money, sporting a 92 maneuverability. Now, we are putting our F-86A pilot in here with all of his skills, so you're looking at an aircraft with an 8.2 second turn time. Pretty dang good. You're in a struggle against some zeros, but honestly, with 450 cal machine guns at this tier, if you get guns on first, not only will you light them on fire, but you will most likely cripple and kill them fairly easily, and you still have really good airspeed. This aircraft is looking at 400 miles an hour boost, but the thing can easily hang out at 400 miles an hour, <clears throat> which is pretty good for this tier, uh, which isn't even true to life because in reality, this aircraft was able to get up to around 500 miles an hour and did pretty well for itself. They only built three test versions of this, but I'm going to try to avoid talking about the history until after we've flown the plane, but it's hard not to because look at this thing. It's such a unique and interesting design with this pusher prop design, and it's very nimble in the roll as well, which just makes it feel very good to fly. As a premium aircraft, it will get bonuses when it comes to its payouts, and if you were lucky enough to get some premium time, possibly from your weekly crates, you're going to have even better luck because it's going to give you a huge bump in the payout. Now, also, you may have picked up a bunch of consumables. Uh, I recommend running these boosters over here. So if you're trying to get credits, we're going to click on booster and we're going to go to procurement system. You can either do one or two hour versions of this and it's essentially going to be doubling your money. So we're going to go ahead and throw on 100% for just an hour and... For those of you that are wondering, V, how did you get the F-86 pilot in there? It's not even trained for the right aircraft. Uh, well, as a premium aircraft, as long as they're the same nationality, you can put any pilot that's American in this aircraft. Just like the Vampire, you can put any British pilot in here and it'll work just fine. Now, you're going to have to be careful, though, because I probably don't want to put in, put in here like my F-94D pilot or my F-84F pilot because... The bonuses from the skill points that go towards the effectiveness of air-to-ground munitions isn't going to be effective on this plane because it doesn't have any. I can still put him in here. It doesn't do anything. Like, boom, there he is. All the skills are active, still at 100%, so he'll still do just fine. And we can sp still build up experience for the pilot because any premium aircraft, the first step you should do is hit this crew button and click Accelerate Crew Training. Otherwise, you're going to build up experience on this plane, and it doesn't lead to anything, so what's the point? Might as well accelerate the crew training, so any experience that would have gone to the crew, or excuse me, would have gone to the aircraft is going to go to the crew instead, making it a much more viable crew trainer. So without any more pontificating on my part, let's go ahead and jump into a battle and see how powerful this aircraft can be. Oof. All right, so here we are in the battle in the legendary XP-55 Ascender, or as the army 
Air Corps folks would call it the Ascender. A little lewd, but at this point, there wasn't many pusher prop designs, so they were like, hey, you built your plane backwards, boss. And that's, uh, whoop. There we go. Too many buttons. And that's, uh, essentially how this thing works. Fun little uh, tidbit, and I mentioned this before. Uh, there was actually a feature to jettison the propeller in the event that the pilot needed to bail out. I'm also going to F2 this because I want, don't want to go in here alone. As you can see, the aircraft has some pretty decent speed to it. And wow, look at that roll rate. Still pretty good. Feels very nice, very nimble. And with the 450 cals at tier 6, this is pretty decent, especially for a light fighter. And it did benefit from the machine gun buff that came just a little while ago. Well, I guess over a year now. But this thing is going to have the ability to climb up and engage heavies like this. So we're going to go ahead and get on target, keeping an eye on the minimap. Not so much that I keep missing my target here. And we'll just throw our paintbrush of bullets on this guy and look for the next one. There is the bow fighter. He's going to turn away, but not before I kill him. And now we'll drop onto the next aircraft. Like I said, this thing actually has some pretty decent capability in the climb. It was called the Ascender for a reason, because part of the requirements for this aircraft was to build a plane that had the ability to climb very rapidly and still be very maneuverable. All right, let's get on this 44. He thinks that he's got the best plane in the game at this tier, but unfortunately for him, he does not have the same maneuverability that I do, so we're going to try and stall the enemy's advance here. What do we got? We've got another XP-55, so we're going to go ahead and tag him, and now we're going up against a Spitfire. I called this thing a spit killer for a reason. We're going to go ahead and get on this guy. Maybe a little bit harder with two planes on my six here. We're just going to keep spinning and eventually we'll hopefully get the opportunity when this guy decides that he's tired of turning in circles. Perfect. And we just picked him up. I'm going to dip the nose. We're going to go get a little bit of wrench. Because why not? We're already fairly low to begin with, and we have the ability to climb like a bit of a rocket ship here. So we're going to go after again, after this key 45. And while I normally don't advocate fighting over airfields for prolonged periods of time, the, <laughs> the enemy keeps feeding us, so it's going to slow down their advance. And we do have the zone advantage for right now, at least. Yeah, P40 is getting that guy. We'll go over to the garrison and see what we can do to pick it up. Always be capping, right? So let's get some aircraft over here. We've got a bomber inbound. I'm actually going to let him go in first, pick up the flak, and then I'm going to go in. Well, I guess I'm picking up the flak. I at least pick up maybe a heavy defense aircraft, so that way I can shoot him off his tail. It makes life a little bit easier. A little bit of strategy here. And unfortunately, it looks like the light fighters are already on me here, so we're going to go ahead and start engaging. Good damage with those 50s, like I mentioned before, and he got taken out by my ally. We're going to go ahead and give him a hand here. Next one's down. We're going to do the ascender thing here. Go on up. I do see that there's a heavy aircraft inbound, but he seems to be vectored on my bomber. So now we're going to defend our ally since we've gotten rid of the flak. And we have gotten rid of the defense fighters that were going to cause me a problem. We're going to go ahead and hit the boost cooler to be able to catch up to this guy. Letting the guns let loose. Secured the kill. And now we are going to look at... Yeah, let's go after that. We'll send people that way. It doesn't mean I'm going to be necessarily prioritizing him here. Nose up. Guns on. And... See you later, alligator. Let's head towards the mid. I'll have to do that now. Um, I'll, yeah. I was going to try and save my bomber. Where is he? There he is. Maybe somebody will get in there and give him a hand. That would be nice. I see the XP-55 down there. All the defense fighters just spawned. Ugh. We're going to try to catch these guys out if I can. They seem to be climbing. Oh, he just rammed us. That sucks. We're at a huge disadvantage here. And, of course, <laughs> we got two target fixated. You got to pay attention to the minimap. 
uh, knowing where the enemy is and where they're coming from is very important. I kind of locked in on the humans and it cost us our aircraft there. Uh, I'm going to avoid going into the middle right this second. Um, looks like our team. Well, you know what? If I can keep this active, we're going to get some altitude so we can kind of control the engagement a little bit and see what we can do to put the enemy on the back foot here. Hopefully we can get one of these zones back, guys. Let's do it. I'm also going to F2 that so the closer aircraft know I'm pretty dedicated to taking that thing out. I'm going to F4 this guy. That's also the Ascender. We don't have enough aircraft here to make this reasonably easy for me. And the P40 is still down there. If they vector in on my bombers, I may have an opportunity here. It looks like the P40 is going for it. But then the Spit... I'm not sure what the spit's doing. Let's go for this guy first. He's trailing. The XP-55 was probably the more dangerous threat, but I'm about to pick him up now, I think, with his engine out. There we go. We picked him up. And now the question is, do we pick a fight with a lone Spitfire? Well, the answer is yes, because V's a crazy man. Because... I felt pretty confident we could have taken that guy out before we got into that ramming situation, but we picked up the zone. <laughs> We're going to work our way over to the enemy airfield. I can almost guarantee you those cats are going to be spawning there as well. In fact, there's the first one, Brigman. My engine is still out. We're going to dip the nose, try and get a little bit of velocity back here. And he seems to be target fixated, and we'll try and take advantage of that as we close on the target. Get these 50s on target. He is the bigger problem right now. Give us a bigger cross section. I'll take it. I'm going to go ahead and throw in the maneuverability mod because I'm about to get bushwhacked by a bunch of defense aircraft as well. Heavy storm here. I should have paid attention to squall line as well. I'm going to get into trouble here. There are planes behind me. We're going to go ahead and turn out of this engagement. Oh, there's another one over here. See it? Heavies inbound. Light fighters inbound. And we got taken out by the IL-2T. You sneaky snook. We still have the zone advantage. We took out one of their human XP-55s. But unfortunately, we are out of the battle. We'll go ahead and follow our P-40 Specialized here. He seems to be doing some pretty decent work right now. Hopefully, we can maintain the advantage. But even if we don't, we're still going to look at the post-game results and see how we did. Another enemy aircraft eliminated, but we also lost a friendly ground attacker. We are looking like we might not maintain the zone advantage. You can see one of our allies has got somebody on a six and he's not paying attention to him. E-45, I'm not sure why he's avoiding tail gunner fire. But these bots, I'll tell you. Some bots are better than others. We're hoping that he can land one of these big cannon shots and knock this guy out. And of course, we have a light fighter back there as well, who's clearly going to be a human. Looks like there's two of them together. Probably the P-40 and the Spit. Yep. We'll see what happens. They are straightening out. Maybe they'll catch some flack, but now they're up against the... PE2. If this guy gets taken out in the zone, it is going to cost us quite a bit, but he's not going to be able to outmaneuver these guys. So unless he decides that he really wants a kill, he sacrificed a lot of our zone control. But we did pick up the airfield and we're still ahead on points and we still have our P40. So let's stay with Bizwinth and see how he's able to perform. Again, we're really here just to see what our payout's going to be, but it's still fun to watch the battle here. And commentate a little bit. It is a bit of a nail biter considering that we are even for aircraft right now. We have control of all airfields in this area. Oh, we got another zone. It's really going to come down, I think, to whether or not Bizworth survives. And he's put himself in a position where he's got enemy aircraft on his six, as well as defense aircraft. You can see the light fighter vector for his position. We still have another human. There's a Spitfire. I didn't see him. We'll see what happens with him as well once he gets taken out. Because look at this. He's not paying attention and the P-40 is on him. 
This is what I was talking about before when I got a little bit zoned in on a single target. But in this case, it was defense aircraft, so he probably could have been a little bit more aware of what was going on there. This guy is in a rolling dogfight with a P-40 and the Spitfire. And he was able to take out the P-40. But where's the Spitfire? We won the match. Let's throw the GG up there. Very close match. We were only down to two aircraft. We did manage to pick up the Akamatsu as well as the Conqueror. Unfortunate that we got taken out right at the beginning of Squall Line. I really should have been paying attention to that. But let's get back to the hangar and see how we did. And again, even playing not my best, you guys can see that this aircraft was very effective on the battlefield. Those 50 cal machine guns are relatively e easy to use. You're going to want to close on the target and engage those guys at closer range to ensure that you're getting maximum volume of hits. And we managed to take out 16 air targets. If we could have stayed a little bit longer, I'm willing to bet a top gun was on the table there. But here's the most important thing. Even only getting... 12,000, which I know for some of you is still a pretty decent uh, achievement, we we're able to get 171,000 credits. That's pretty dang good. And if we were running a premium account, it would have been 214. Now with a premium aircraft, you probably would have gotten over 200,000 um, credits here. But if you were wondering what's the best way to get credits in this game, the XP-55 is probably the easiest aircraft to get as a free premium and it won't disappoint you. This is my build that you can see down here. We've gone with the full maneuverability build as well as throwing on the reinforced airframe because all it hurts is your roll maneuverability. It doesn't affect your actual turning like polished skin would have. And I think you actually sacrifice a lot more of your speed if you do decide that you wanted to go with a reinforced skin. And honestly, I like having the speed availability. It lets me get around the battlefield, and we were doing pretty dang good there. I, I do like that the consumable setup allows us to be able to put on two consumables for the airframe, allowing us to be able to fix a wing or a tail if it gets taken out, as well as pneumatic assist. And when we take a look at our score one more time, we can go ahead and see what aircraft we managed to take out. And we took out six fighters, two multi-rolls, two heavies, and six defense fighters. Uh, that's, or excuse me, yeah, it's six light fighters. So that's a lot of light fighters. I mean, that was the volume of our kills. And we know we took out the P-40, we took out the Spit, we took out the XP-55, twice at least. And that's another aircraft just like our own. And it's because those 50 cals got on target early and you can see how much damage they can chew up. I think going with a max maneuverability build is going to be your best bet. I wouldn't spec out a pilot specifically for this aircraft. In fact, there should be no pilot that's trained to the XP-55. Just keep moving them from whatever aircraft you're currently working on so that way you can keep building up that pilot's skill points so that way they're more effective in their primary aircraft or when you're ready to move them onto the subsequent aircraft. Now, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the history. So just like the interesting look of this aircraft, there's an interesting story behind its design and concept. The Army Air Corps put out a requirement when we were trying to catch up with our aircraft design at the beginning of the war for an aircraft that had good climb, good maneuverability, in space to mount armament. Four companies put in bids for the aircraft. Uh, all of them had the possibility of being as unique and innovative as they as they wanted them to be in fact it was something the army air corps put into the requirement they're like you can make it as innovative as you want as long as it does what we ask it to do we don't care what it looks like so go for it now there were some crazy designs apparently but the ascender was the oddest of all of them obviously with a pusher design and this weird type of canard elevator system in the for forward end of the aircraft it was designed by Curtis Wright, as you can see in the top right-hand corner underneath the name. And it was going through initial trials, and they gave them money to be able to build up a scaled-down powered model of it for wind tunnel testing. They had designed it, they set it up, and the army wasn't ready to invest in building a prototype. So what did Curtis Wright do? They spent their own money and built up a full-scale prototype and when they built that full-scale prototype they did over 200 flights with this aircraft 
and it exceeded their expectations. It did really well. It cruised at like 500 miles an hour. The thing was very powerful. And the Army Air Corps said, you know what? You're right. This thing's pretty dang good. You can build three more prototypes on our dime with a different drivetrain because they used a Pratt & Whitney back then, but the Pratt & Whitney engine they were using was discontinued in between the initial prototype and the prototypes licensed by the U.S. military. As a result, these things actually flew. Now, unfortunately, they did lose one of the prototypes during a crash uh, during flight testing, but the aircraft did very well. It had great handling characteristics, but at slow speed and had a little bit of problems. Uh, this thing was also water-cooled, which was still a relatively new thing. A lot of aircraft were doing the air-cooled game. So with this thing being water-cooled, which was almost a necessity since how was air going to get to the engine in the back of the plane, uh, it made it a little bit more conceivable that you could have a pusher designed to use a water-cooled system, but it increased weight and increased complexity. And the other problem was, despite all of their efforts to try and be able to get that radiator to get air through uh, these intakes, it wasn't enough and the thing ran into overheating problems. Uh, of course, being a really weird design and having some funny characteristics, uh, it did have some weird issues. And as a result, uh, they decided was it wasn't necessarily where they wanted to go. They wanted something that was a little bit more traditional, despite them saying you could do something unique. And the XP-55 project never really got off the ground beyond those prototypes. But it did fly and it was real. And a lot of the test pilots initially were a little bit hesitant about the idea of having a man chopper in the back of their aircraft because back then they didn't have ejection seats. So if you wanted to bail out of the aircraft, you had to open the hatch and jump out. And there's a big old saw blade behind you. Well, good news. They thought of that and they put in that propeller ejection system but a lot of pilots were still kind of hesitant, like, okay, that's fine, but what if the ejector system doesn't agree with you and decides not to disengage? Now you're in a really rough spot. Do I risk bringing in this aircraft that has low controllability at low speed, <clears throat> unpowered gliding into the ground, or do I risk being turned into confetti? Little bit rough situation to be in, but you know, in reality, the thing that was really ahead of its time, having a sweep wing design, having the canards in the front really allow you to be able to get a lot of pitch because essentially your center of lift is towards the aft end of the aircraft, which means the front end of the aircraft is relatively light, especially with the engine in the back, allowing you to be able to get all of your control from the canards in the front. And the entire canard swiveled. You can kind of see right here, there's a bit of a ring. That's because this was the pivot point. The whole thing flexed. It wasn't like a little control surface like you would see on an aileron or something like that. This whole thing would twist in order to give you better pitch. And it worked very well. I mean, I mean, this seems like it shouldn't work, right? But it's crazy to me this was designed in 1943 and was able to do the things that it was able to do. And I think if the technology was a little bit better, if they could have cooled the engine easier, they probably would have had a very winning design here. And 450 cals, all mounted in the nose like that, centrally located, what an innovative concept. You didn't have to worry about setting up the guns that way they converged in front of the aircraft at a certain range, because on the old like Mustangs and the Corsairs, they actually had to set up the wing mounted guns. So they were slightly, there we go, slightly tilted in. So that way they would converge at a point in front of the aircraft. Now that meant that there were spots where the bullets were actually crossing each other at when you were further away. And then when you were closer, there was essentially a window of life where if you were close enough, my guns were firing on either side of your aircraft and not hitting you directly. This alleviated all of those issues. And people don't think about that when we talk about this video game because it kind of has a auto adjustment, the bullets go where your reticle is type of concept. But if you were to play like a true flight sim, you may have the option to even set up the convergence point. So knowing when you could fire your guns and when you might need to tilt the wings so only half of the guns are hitting was a real problem. 
but not anymore. And that's why all of our aircraft today, we wanted to mount the guns in the nose. I mean, look at the A-10 Warthog. The thing's mounted right in the center of the fuselage, right underneath the cockpit, and allows you to be able to get really precise accuracy. So, I mean, being a jet also helps. But anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed taking a look at the Ascender. Hopefully this helped you be able to get a few more credits out there so that way you can advance to the next airframe. And hopefully as you continue to get those credits, you can get the aircraft required in order to get the medals you need to unlock the de Havilland Vampire. Because, man, this thing with its four 20 millimeter cannons, really small cross section, high speed, it's a beautiful plane, and honestly, when I see these things on the battlefield, I keep my head out, I keep my head on a swivel and my eyes out of the cockpit to look out for these things because they can be very dangerous, especially since most pilots have flown the wings off of them so they know exactly what to do and how to fly it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video, and as always, I'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>